Chapter 9 is uh, solids and liquids. Well, let me try that again. Yeah, that's the title of the chapter, solids and liquids. But we're covering, uh, we need to understand how all of it fits together. So we've got solids, wait, what are the four states of matter? Y'all should know this, right? Okay, so how do we go from here to here? Melting. Yeah, you melt it, right? What is that? How do you melt something? Heat. You add heat. Okay, so to go from here to here, you add heat. Q stands for heat. I don't, it's not my fault, that's just the way it is. Q stands for heat. Now, <clears throat> there's another piece to this, though. We think of Q, we think of it only in terms of heat because that's how you do water on the stove top, right? You just, you just, that's what you do. But there's another piece here that could play a factor, and you don't normally do this in your daily life, but you could play with the pressure. You, you can play with the pressure one way or the other, and, and um, the two can work together to make that happen. Does that make sense to everybody? So, uh, this thing is full of water. Uh, <clears throat> I guess we're not outside anymore can't see. Okay. Uh, to go from liquid to gas, what do you do there? Same thing, right? This is like if we were took a chunk of ice to put it in a pot, add heat. That's how you get it turned into liquid. How you take it from li liquid to steam, add heat. But again, the same thing, pressure can also be a factor. Like we just operate at atmospheric pressure, so we don't think about changing the pressure, but you could do that. Now, the step from gas to plasma is a little bit different. Any guesses there? You still have those same two pieces. You can, it's, it's, you can add heat, you can manipulate the pressure, but there's another piece to it. It's got to be ionized. Plasma is not just hotter, <laughs> more, more, more temperature, it's not just that. It's also ionized. Now, what does that mean? Charged. Yeah, it means you've charged it. Either removed or added an electron. Okay, so now, the next thing you think is you think, okay, solid, that's like ice and metal and wood, I got it. Okay, liquid, that's like water and all kinds of other liquids that we're familiar with. And, and gas, don't think gasoline. Not gasoline, this is... This is the stuff that we're breathing right now. Air is in the gaseous form. It, what's the majority of the stuff that we're breathing? What chemical? Nitrogen. 72% of what you're breathing right now is nitrogen. 72%. What does nitrogen do for you? How does it help your body? Y'all are biology majors, you should know this. The answer? Nothing. It doesn't help you in the least. Does it hurt you? No, not really. <laughs> unless, you dr unless you breathe entirely nitrogen, then you just suffocate. But it doesn't help or hurt you, it's just there. But what's 21% of the stuff that you breathe? Oxygen. Oxygen, and that's the stuff we need, okay? But then there's a bunch of other things too. So, um, so, so we're familiar with these, and you think, well, plasma, that's pretty rare. We never have to deal with that. In the scope of the universe, this is almost everything. Almost everything is plasma. Let me just put it in terms of our, of our solar system, okay? If you take all the planets, all the asteroids in between, and the sun, that's our solar system, okay? And add up all their masses, the sun is 99.87% of the mass. 99.87. And it's entirely plasma. So in the scope of the universe, this is the predominant form of matter. By far. It's not even close. But this chapter, we're going to be de dealing with these. Do we ever deal with plasma here in our normal life? I mean, other than the sun shining on us? Anybody ever built a campfire? 
plasma. How about uh, the, not these lights, but uh, fluorescent tube lights, the glowing stuff in there, plasma. Neon lights, plasma. So we do deal with it, it's just not as common. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, well, um, <clears throat> within, uh, within solids, there's two kinds of solids that we need to know, deal with, and that's amorphous. How do you spell more? I spelled that all wrong. Amorphous, there we go. And crystalline. Let's do crystalline first. What's that mean? Like you think of crystalline, right? It's like, oh, that's the pretty shape, right? What, what makes it, why is it orderly and pretty? Any ideas? Think, think uh, s snowflakes falling from the sky. They're all in these nice, pretty hexagonal features. Y'all have seen this stuff, right? It's because of the crystalline nature of water. When water adheres to itself and becomes a solid, it naturally forms those crystalline structures. So what I'm saying is the molecules, each molecule one at a time adds up to form the shape of the individual molecules. So crystalline structure is all the molecules are lined up and stuck together in a way that resembles the molecule, the individual molecule. So with water you get hexagonal features but with quartz, you get a different shape. And with, there's different kinds of crystalline things. But some things don't form that way, some things form amorphous. Any ideas what that is? If you now, now that you know what crystalline is, you can make a pretty good guess what amorphous looks like. What's that gonna look like? Say it again. Is it just like, it's just gonna be any shape? Yeah, yeah, the molecules don't line up necessarily according to their shape. They just, they stick to each other in harem scarum sort of ways and you end up with something that kind of resembles a potato. It doesn't really have any particular shape at all. <clears throat> okay. Now, so let's deal with solids first. In this chapter of solids and liquids, let's deal with solids first. Now the first thing you need to know is that every solid is a spring. Every solid is a spring. Okay, how's that? I mean, okay, we've dealt with springs before, you know, those stretchy things, right? We've, we've talked about springs, we understand they store energy, we, we got all that, but you're telling me that this table, that's a spring? How so? That doesn't, I don't see it being springy. Well, let's talk about the tight table top. What's the table top made out of? Wood. It's particle board, but all the same, that's wood, right? Y'all familiar, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, do you see that tree out the window there? The wind's blowing pretty good today, that's why we're in here. And you see the branches? They wave back and forth. Why are they going back and forth? It's a spring. It's being pushed by the wind, and the wind relents, so it goes back. It's a big, giant spring. And that tree is what this desk is made out of. And you say, but the iron legs, those aren't springy. They are. If you push on it hard enough, it will compress. For that matter, this plastic pen. If I push on it hard enough, it'll compress. Everything will compress or expand if you pull on it. It all acts that way, and it'll go back to where it came from, just like a spring. Say it again. Well, now there's, there's multiple factors in here. There's brittleness, too, that you have to deal with. For instance, glass, although it's, it is a spring, it's a solid, it's also very brittle. So it won't compress very far before you break it. But metal will compress a good ways. It's actually kind of shocking how far it goes. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about elastic limit. So with a regular spring, if you take your pen apart and pull the little spring out of it, you can pull it a little ways and it'll go back. 
But if you pull it a long ways, what does it do? It'll stay straight because you've gone past the elastic limit. So this is true with all things. So the, the metal, the wood, everything has its elastic limit and it's different for every type of material. So glass is a nice example. Its elastic limit is not very much. It, it does have an elastic limit and it will stretch and it will compress, but if you push it too far, it's just gonna shatter. Does that make sense? So, so within the elastic limit, it's a spring and the elastic limit is different for every type of material. Okay, does that answer y'all's questions? Those are good questions. Glad y'all thought about that. Okay, well, what's the equation that we use for springs? Hooke's law. F equals negative K delta X. Hooke's law. What's the delta X? How much it's or yeah, you either stretched it or smashed it, right? And that's this. That's how far, it's a distance. How much you stretched it or how much you smashed it. What's the K? It's a constant. It goes with each spring. Now that's a key here. In this equation, the K describes the spring, the individual manufactured spring, okay? Or rubber band. Uh, why is there a negative sign here? Was that a question? Oh, okay. Any ideas why there's a negative sign? No, no, it's not a cancel out thing. I wish there was a rubber band in here. I didn't bring one. Okay, so you'll have to pretend. Say I attach a rubber band to the side of this desk right here, okay? There's a rubber band right there and I'm gonna pull it. I just stretched it from here to here. It's a rubber band. I know there's not actually one, but pretend. Which way did I pull it? This way, right? Which way is it pulling me? That way. That's why there's a negative sign. It's just that simple. Does that make sense? Whichever way you stretch it, the rubber band is going to pull the other way. That's why there's a negative sign. Okay? Yeah? For the delta x, um, is it positive even if it's stretched or compressed? Or it it, it, the, the positive or negative depends on your coordinate system. So whichever way you say is positive, if you pull it that way, it'll be positive. But if you pull it the other way, it'll be negative. Okay, so this force here is the force of the spring. Okay. Now, what I'm going to show you in this chapter is the same equation, but modified. So that instead of working for an individual spring and only applicable to a particular spring, I'm going to show you the version of this equation that can be applied to all types of material. So here's what it looks like. Oops. There it is. So instead of dealing with a, a force, you have a force over an area. Delta L, well that's the same thing. That's just how much did it stretch or smash. But now it's not just delta L, it's delta L compared to, well how long was it in the first place? Initial length. And instead of having a spring constant that's good for each spring, you have this thing, it's, it's another constant, it's called the Young's modulus, named after the guy who first measured the whole bunch of stuff. It depends on the material. So this, this value will be the same for anything made out of oak, or anything made out of steel, or anything made out of aluminum, or whichever material you're talking about. So the Young's modulus goes with the material, not necessarily the spring. Do you see the difference between these two? <clears throat> and now you say, well, that doesn't look at all like the same equation. Let me just rearrange it slightly here. What if I multiply both sides by A so that it cancels out over here, and then I just rewrite it a little bit so that we have F is equal to AY over L naught times delta L. And then we call all this stuff in the middle K. Oh, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's just that your initial length and your area 
def def define the spring itself. Now what about the negative sign? Why isn't there a negative sign here? Well, it's because by this point, y'all have been through enough physics that you don't need a negative sign to tell you which way is it going to pull. Are you talking about the spring pulling on you? Because if I, if I had that spring attached to the edge of the table and I pulled it, I know it's going to pull me the other way. But if I'm talking about how hard do I have to pull it, well, then I'm going to pull it this way. So it lets you decide which way is it pulling. You have to draw a picture and figure it out. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? You said that delta L was same as delta X. Yep, it's just how much is it stretched or smashed. Okay, now let's, there's one more piece in here that's a little bit confusing, so let me talk about that. Where'd that eraser go? Wasn't there? Oh, here it is. Force over area, Young's modulus, oops, delta L upstairs, initial length downstairs. It's this area. What area are we talking about? Okay, so if this were the object that we were applying this equation to, and I take this side and this side and I push it, okay, I'm squeezing it, and it's going to shrink. Okay, so the delta L is how much it shrinked. We'd look up the Young's modulus for plastic. The initial length, we'd have to measure this to start with before I squashed it to find that. The force is how hard did I push on it. The area is the cross-sectional area of this circle. Okay, so the area that we're referring to here is cross-sectional area. I'm not talking about the area this way. I'm talking about the area of just the circle on the end, the cross-section. So if we were talking about this big post over here, these, these nice pillars that are holding up our ceiling for us, it's kind of nice of them to do that for us. See those pillars? The, how do we find that cross-sectional area? Any ideas? Say it again. Yeah, it's you just, we wouldn't want to actually do this, but you chop it in half, right, and tip it over and say, oh, there's a circle. And then find the area of that circle. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, we could figure out that area without chopping it in half. How do we figure that area out? This is just, you know, y'all should know this. How do you find the area of a circle without chopping it in half? Yeah, that'd probably be the easiest way to do it. Wrap a string around it, measure the circumference, find the length of that string, and then what's the equation for a circumference? Circumference is 2 pi r. Once you know r, can you get the area? Yes. How's, what's the area? Pi r squared. The area is pi r squared. There we go. Okay, so there you go. Now you can find the area of a circle. That was just kind of an aside. <laughs> okay, how y'all doing? Does this kind of make sense with this version of Hooke's Law? Uh, let me tell you, when you, when you uh, go into uh, graduate school in, in physics or engineering, you're going to take class. Uh, the, 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 there's a whole class I had this uh, one semester on just this equation as an undergrad, and then another semester, two more semesters in graduate school on just this equation. J there's a whole lot buried right there, okay? There's a whole lot buried. Um, but we're just going to spend a piece of a chapter, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's do a problem. Y'all ready for a problem? Here we go. Uh, let me read it to you. The Golden Gate Bridge. Y'all familiar with this, right? The big red bridge in San Francisco that goes across the bay. It's a famous, it's probably the most famous bridge in the world. The Golden the <laughs> Golden Gate Bridge. How many of y'all have been there? Walked on it? Nobody? Okay. It's it's pretty impressive. It's it's six lanes of interstate on each side and a large walkway for pedestrians. And there's tons of pedestrians walking it all the time because it's such a popular place to walk. It's just, and, okay, it's, it's, a, it's very impressive. Let me finish reading the question. I just got the first three words. The Golden Gate Bridge weighs 419,800 tons. 
Let me write that number down. Four hundred and nineteen thousand eight hundred tons. What's a ton? Two thousand pounds. One ton is two thousand pounds. This bridge is four hundred and nineteen thousand eight hundred tons. It's kind of big. I say that with, I don't know, sarcasm, is that the right word to describe that? I, I, I meaning is, is huge. This thing's colossal. It's, it's shockingly impressive. Okay? Now, it's a suspension bridge. What does that mean? It's just hanging. It's free to swing. 419,800 tons, and it's just swinging there in the breeze. Okay? It's a suspension bridge. Now, you can't just hang that with any old yarn that you buy at the local thread store. They don't just hang that lightly, because it's not light. They use massive steel cables. Okay, so here's the way they do this. They'll put a pylon, and this is the big red steel structure, and that pylon is built into a concrete block that goes way down into the ground, down to the bedrock. And of course, this is all underwater, so you don't even see the concrete pylon. But it's down there, and then there's that big red thing that everybody's familiar with sticking out of the water. And then there's another one over here, this big red thing over here, with the concrete pylon under the ground, under the water. <coughs> and then there's this gigantic, that's a cable. This is one cable, okay? And that particular cable, we're not going to do the math on that. That, that equation is kind of difficult. But that cable is probably, I don't know, maybe this big around, steel cable, okay? It's huge. People walk on it. They usually are arrested shortly thereafter. But they do. I'm not suggesting you go there and try. <laughs> but people, if it's big enough, you can walk on the thing. People, they do it, they're paid to do it, to paint it, because it's red. How do you get steel to be red? You paint it. So what happens to steel, what happens to paint on steel? It comes off over time. How long has this bridge been there? I don't know, but it's been there for a while. Somebody, brave person, paid well, mind you, has to paint this thing. <laughs> on a semi-regular basis. Anyway, anyway, so there's this big giant cable up here. It's huge. And then there's the chunk of concrete. Big chunk of concrete. That's this thing. Okay, the chunk of concrete. And it is hanging off of 500 smaller cables. Steel cables. And those smaller cables, they're this big around. Steel <laughs> cables. Okay, 500 of those things. Does this make sense to everybody? Y'all doing all right? Okay, it's these things that's this problem. Okay, so let me finish reading the problem now. <clears throat> that bridge is suspended by 500 vertical cables. After the bridge is suspended, the longest of those cables is 500 feet long. That's a long cable. <laughs> a long, big cable, and it's 500 feet long. <clears throat> and these cables are made of steel. It gives you the long, Young's modulus for that. And then it says the diameter of that. And then the question, here's the question. What was the length of the longest cable before the bridge was built? Now, now think about this. Somebody had to build this thing, right? And you got to get all, you, you order your steel cable from here, you, you order your pylons from there, you order your concrete from here, and you get it all showing up at the same place, and you start building this piece by piece, and somebody says, well, we got to cut those cables now. How long should I cut them? The longest one has to end up being 500 feet. Do I cut it 500 feet long? Why not? It's going to stretch when you hang that big old honking bridge on it. You can't make it 500 feet. You've got to cut it to the right length so that after the bridge is hung on it, then it's 500 feet. Does that make sense to everybody? And notice they're all different lengths. 
So you've got to calculate each one of these and figure out what length do I cut them from so that when I get done, the bridge is nice and flat. Because if I cut them according to their final length, the bridge is going to be all wonky and it'll break. You don't want people, I mean, people are going to die. When, you, when bridges break, people die. Bad idea. <laughs> okay. Well, how are we going to figure out that original length? Let me, let me give you those numbers in metric units here. Okay. The mass, <coughs> the mass of the concrete portion of the bridge is 3.808 times 10 to the 8th kilograms. Okay, the longest cable, well there, there's 500 of them, but the longest one is, and that's the, this is the final length, is 500 feet, which in meters is 152.4 meters. That's a f, f for final. And then the, um, the Young's modulus for steel is 200.0 times 10 to the 9 pascals. And then the diameter, um, I'll just write out diameter here, diameter of the cable is 68.2 millimeters. Okay? Yeah? Would it always give us the answer in the standard yeah, sometimes it'll give you metric units. Sometimes you get you have to you have to work the equation with metric units. Okay. So whatever so units it gives you, you've got to convert it. Yeah, sometimes you might have to do these conversions on your own. Okay. And the constant is given in, in pascals. Yeah, let's talk about pascals for a minute. Okay, so that equation over here is force over area is equal to Young's modulus times change in length over initial length. This force over area, how hard you're pushing it, over cross-sectional area, that's pressure. Pressure is force over area. I know it's sad because we just got done doing the last chapter where we said P is power and that's work over time. And yes, they're both capital P's, and it's not my fault, it's just the way it is. I'm sorry. This is a vector, though. Force over capital is in pressure, it's a vector. This one's not. There's no vectors here. This one is a vector, so that might help a little bit. They're both capital P's, though, sadly. And then you have P for momentum, too, just to... But that's lowercase p, so... I know, because what's the difference between a P and a P and a P? Yeah, I don't know. When <laughs> on, on the equation sheet, it does be kind of confusing. Yeah. If you look at it like two, right? Yep, yep. So keep your P's straight. <laughs> or as the common language says, mind your P's and Q's. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> oh, and uh, I was telling you, so pressure is force over area, what are the units of force? Newtons. Newtons. What are the units for area? Well, let me try it this way. If we were measuring uh, one of these squares of the carpet, we measured that, how would we find the area of a square? Length. length. Well, that'd be volume. But just length times width would be area, right? Mm -hmm. So we just do length. What are the units for length? Meters. Meters. And for width? meters, so length times width would be meters times meters, which would be meters squared. So the units for pressure are newtons per meter squared. But I've already explained to you that physicists are lazy folks, and we don't write that. We write pascals, just because it's easier. It's pressure? Yes. So the, the units, constant? say it again? In the constant? Yes. So the units for pressure are pascals, which is a shorthand for newtons per meter squared. Of course, if you remember, newtons is also shorthand for something else. <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, and so then notice pascals are the units for Young's modulus. Young's modulus is a pressure. But what, what's the unit for this? 
Well, what's delta L? Meters. What's L? What's a meter over a meter? It's unitless, right? Anything over itself is one. So this is a unitless number. So this, because this thing equals this thing, these two have to have the same units. Okay, I saw a hand, hand up. Was that you, Rod? Who had their hand up? Somebody had a hand up a minute ago. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask, so since the constant is in Pascal's and it's just newts over meters, that just means that it's just the amount of force. So yep, force per area is all it is. And, and, and I usually do this demonstration. Um, if you... Um, Alexa, you're close over here. I think my cord can reach there. Okay, can you put your hand on the table here? Okay, now if I push on your hand with my hand, okay, are you ready? I put about, I don't know, 10 pounds of force there. Did that hurt? No. But there was some force there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now what if I push... <laughs> you see your flinch? Why do you flinch? Because it's pointy. It's pointy. That would hurt, wouldn't it? Why would that hurt? Look. Yes. Look. Force over area is pressure. What happens when area gets really, really tiny, like the tip of a pencil? The pressure yeah, as area goes down, pressure goes up. That's why the, me pushing the point of a pencil onto Alexa's hand would really hurt, because <laughs> the pressure would go through the roof. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's do this problem. We've, what, do, what do we need to find here? We're trying to find the initial length. We need initial length. Where is that in this equation? Underneath. It's here. There's another place. Where's the other place? The the minus. Yeah, what does that delta L mean? It's final, exactly. It's final minus initial. So this piece up here is L final minus L initial. That's what delta always means. So we have to solve this equation for L initial, and it shows up twice, here and here. Oh, um, it you have to, so, uh, let me see, I'll just write it out over here. L F minus L naught over L naught is L F over L naught minus L naught over L naught. And this could cancel out, but not that. Does that make sense? So, um, you can't just cancel this out. That would be illegal. Does that make sense? Because you've you got to have it over here. Yes. You could write it that way if you wanted to. I usually don't, but you could do it that way if you wanted to. Okay, so how are we going to get L naught by itself? Yeah, let's send L naught over here. Okay, let's multiply both sides by L naught. L naught here, L naught here, and I'll carry this math up over here. So this will be um, L naught times force over area equals Young's modulus times L final minus L initial. Now what? Yeah, let's distribute this Young's modulus in here and here. You've got to multiply it through on both pieces. Okay, so this would be L naught times force over area. We haven't touched the left side, but the right side is going to be Y times LF minus Y times L naught. <coughs> okay, now what? Yeah, let's take this and add it over here to the other side. So we've got L naught times F over A plus Y times L naught 
equals y times lf. So we just combined like terms there. Now what? Yeah, let's pull this L initial out so that we have L initial times force over area plus Y equals Y times LF. One last step. Yeah, let's just divide this fraction downstairs over there. And so we finally end up with our answer over here. This will be um, L naught will be equal to Y times LF over F over area plus Y. Okay. Everybody happy with all that algebra? <laughs> Not happy with it, but can do it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, it's all right. Well, when, it, when the question comes, just yell it out. Any other questions? Y'all doing all right? Okay. No, no, Go no. ahead. So this always confuses me mm -hmm. trying to solve for something. Mm -hmm. But why did you bring the L initial over instead of the L final if we're trying to solve for the L initial? Wouldn't it be easy to just leave it on that side? On the second oh, side? over here? Yeah. We, you're right. We could, but see, the thing is, we've got two L knots. Oh. And so, what I was trying to do is get all the L knots on one side or the other. So, if we, we brought that one over there, we'd have to bring this over here. So, rather than doing two steps, I just did one. Okay. But one way or the other, you've got to get all the L knots on one side. Yeah, because sometimes that confuses me, like knowing which to bring over when I'm mm -hmm. to Mm hmm. The key is combine like terms. Yeah. Oh, good question. Fortunately for this problem, everything's Y. So there is no X. So even though there's like but, but you're right. You're right. This is a force. So we got to deal with X and Y. But for this particular problem, everything's up and down. So there's no X's. We're just doing Y's. Pressure can go, can be crooked. Well, I'll give you some more definitions of pressure in a little while. So we're, we're just focusing on the vertical cable. This is all up and down. Yeah, we're not dealing with that, that wonky cable that's all, that curvy cable. That would be very complex, and we're not going down that road. Um, I teach another class called Engineering Physics, and we deal with it there, though. So if you want to take that, um, it'll, we'll do it next. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Was that yeah as a question or? No. no. Okay. Uh, so let me scoot this over. This is kind of nice having rolling whiteboards here. Okay. So let's figure out what each of these pieces are. What's why? It's given, right? We just plug it in. 200 times 10 to the 9. Uh, by the way, you probably will see this on some problems. Most metals have a number times 10 to the 9. And that is a G, giga. So you'll see, often see this written as 200 gigapascals. Okay? So in case you run across that later down the road, most of the metals, like the steel, the aluminum, the whatever, their Young's modulus will be written in terms of gigapascals. Does that make sense there? And that just means times 10 to the 9. Okay? Wood will be much smaller. They might write it in terms of megapascals instead. What would be a megapascal? Ten to the 6. To the six. So a giga is 10 to the 9, a mega is 10 to the 6. Okay, and that would be a capital M mega. Okay, so why is that? So we just, that, what do I plug in for L final? 500. Uh, nope, that's, that's English units, we need metric units. Oh, the, the um, one point, I mean, 
Yeah, so we just plug in L final is 152.4. Um, there's Young's modulus again. Area, what are we going to plug in there? Yeah, we got to find that, don't we? So, how are we going to find it? Yeah, this number here, so it gives us, so to find our area, we're, we're given the diameter is 68.2 millimeters. So, start, to start with, what does the diameter mean? Yeah, it's, it's from here to there. It's the distance across the circle. That doesn't help us. What do we need? You said it, Paige. What do we need? We need the radius. So step one here is to do what? You've got to divide that by two. So the radius is 68.2 divided by two. Now those are millimeters. How's that doing? Will millimeters work? What do we need? Meters. So what do we do? Divide by a thousand. Uh, because, let's break out the railroad tracks here. There's a thousand millimeters in one meter. So, uh, what is that, 34.1? I think I did that right in my head. Doing math in my head in front of people is always dangerous. Did I do that right? 30, so the radius here is 34.1 millimeters. But to get that to meters, we need to move this decimal three places to the left. Does that make sense to everybody? So this will be 0 0.0341 meters. Everybody happy with that? OK, now what about, how do we, but we don't want radius either. What do we want? What's our equation called for? Area, so what do we need? Pi r squared. So the area here, <coughs> is going to be pi r squared. So this is going to, somebody punch that out for me. There's your radius. There's, you know what pi is. Uh, tell me what the area is here. Zero, zero, three, seven? Is that what I heard? Okay. Uh, can you give me a couple more decimal places? Six, five, one. Okay, good. In general, uh, for, uh, for WebAssign especially, because it always wants three sig figs for your answer, carry out these other things more than three sig figs, at least four, okay? Do at least four. It's best just to save the number on your calculator and not even round it off at all. But um, there you go. So at least do, do more than three sig figs. Okay, one more piece here, force. What are we going to plug in there for force? What's pulling on this steel cable? The, the, yeah, the force of gravity, the weight of the bridge, right? How do we find weight? Yeah, weight <coughs> is mg. What's the mass? Oh yeah, it's that big number over there, 3.808 times 10 to the 8th. That's a giant number. 3.808 times 10 to the eighth, times 9.81. But wait a second. Is all of that pulling on one cable? So what do we do about this? Yeah, it, that, that weight is split up over 500 cables. So one cable is holding, is holding up 1 500th of that bridge. Does that make sense to everybody? Say it again now. Different. Oh, different sizes. Yeah, they're different lengths, but all, all the same, they're still pulling up with the same. So each of those cables is holding it up with 500, one five hundredth of the force. So we need to take this and divide it by 500 to deal with one cable at a time. Okay, so y'all punch that out. Tell me what the force is here. Seven four seven what? One two nine six. Nine six <laughs> newtons. That's a big number. Now wait wait let me point something out here because you're gonna you're gonna plug all this in in a second but you're gonna take that force 
And the equation says, take the force and divide it by area. And what's your area? Well, that's that. What happens when you take a big number and divide it by a tiny number? It gets bigger. <laughs> it starts out big, and now it's going to get bigger. OK, go ahead and start punching it all out. Plug all those. There's all your numbers. Plug them all in here. Y'all tell me what the original length was. Well, that is, this is the tension. So, um, like we don't have to do the sum of all forces to yeah. find that number? Yeah, I, I cheated. I did that in my head before we started. So let me write that over here and show you what I did. These rolling boards are kind of fun. I need some rolling boards like this outside. I hope I didn't break that. Okay, so I uh, here's one five hundredth of the bridge. Okay, it's a lot longer than this, and there's one cable holding this this piece up. Okay, what are the forces on that bridge? Okay, its own weight is pulling it down, and and tension is pulling it up, and. How much is that bridge moving? Not. So when we do sum of the forces equals MA, what's A? Zero. Zero. So we say tension minus MG over 500 is equal to zero. So now we say tension is MG over 500, and that's where I got that thing over there. So that's the only force. Yep, that's the force pulling on that cable, and that's, well, that's what's stretching it out. But you should use the sum of all forces. To right, to, to figure that out. You're absolutely right. You, you, you have got to go back to Newton's second law to figure that out. OK, did anybody punch it out yet? No, you just use the tension. And, but like in other problems, like if there were well, you use the net force to find whatever the force is that's pulling on, uh, pulling or pushing on your. So in this case, we, we were looking for the tension. We used gravity and tension to find the tension. So you might use multiple things to find the tension, or the the compression. What did this cable end up at? 152.4. That's a meter and a half. What's that? What's that? Let's see. Here's a meter, meter and a half, about an arm's length, just about. That's a lot of stretching. If you if the if the engineer had cut it at 500 feet, what would that bridge look like? <laughs> It'd be going uh, uh, meter and a half too long. <laughs> That bridge is going to break. You got to cut it to the right length before you build the bridge. Okay, how y'all doing? Is all this making sense? That's good because I'm five minutes over. <laughs> okay, thanks, y'all. I better run off to your next class. Sorry.